All right, so we want to welcome you tonight to the presentation on water and soil quality. And SELCO, which is the Southeast Library Cooperative, um, and the Experiment in Rural Cooperation, which is part of the University of Minnesota, um, have partnered together to bring these programs to the local libraries. Uh, my name is Amy Larson, and I'm here representing SELCO, and Aaron Meyer here in the brown is representing the ERC. And the funding was provided from a LSTA grant, the Library and Sciences, no, nope, Library Services Technology Act, um, which is federally administered by the Institute of the Museum and Library Services. That part I have to write down. We're excited tonight to welcome Deb Allen, who's an associate professor of oh, water. Now I'm a full. Oh, I haven't updated that. Oh, she hasn't updated that. So you're right. <laughs> She's a full professor at the. Um, at the University of Minnesota in Soil and Water. And without further ado, I'll turn the time over to you. All right. Thank you. Yes, and um, I, I have to say, I'm kind of emphasizing soil quality in this talk, although there's an obvious connection to water quality. But uh, soil quality is more my area of research. And I do know plenty of people doing various projects on water quality, and I'm happy to try to answer questions or refer you to more knowledgeable people. But if it would be OK, what I'd like to do, just since there aren't very many of you, to have an idea who my audience is here, if I could have you each just introduce yourselves and what, what kind of um, thing you do for your life work. I guess we could say it like that. You want to start? <coughs> I'm working on my third cold season, but my name is Melissa Petler. I'm a farmer right now, but I used to work for uh, USDA. I used to be soil conservation service. Oh, great. I'm uh, John Jager, farmer south of Redley. Mm -hmm. uh, soil and water for us. Right? Okay. And you? Okay. Uh, Glenn Robertson, and I uh, work for the Soil and Water Conservation District here in Bibi County. Um, grew up on a beef farm, Wabashaw County. Started my career as a water plant. Great. <coughs> and how about you? I'm Bernita Paul from Pine Island, Minnesota, and I am on the Zumbo Watershed Partnership. Oh, great. I have a lot to do with flooding and stuff because we have a lot of Okay. I'm Larry Tomford. I farm six miles north of town here, and I'm also a member of the uh, Soil and Water Conservation District Board of Supervisors. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of people probably were expecting me to talk about water quality. <laughs> And how about you? We're asking people to just introduce themselves. Uh, Ken McNamara from Goody. Goody County Soil and Water Board. All right. And how about you? I'm just going to sound like a broken record. Tim Gossman, Fillmore County uh, Soil and Water District Supervisor. OK. So not a lot of producers, but lot, well, some. Yeah. Half, <coughs> half or two thirds producers, but lots of, um, are all of you that are on the board produce Farmer your time. farmers? Okay, good. Well, and I, although I am in the Twin Cities at the St. Paul campus in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate, I actually have a, um, an investment in good agriculture and uh, water, soil and water quality in this area because my folks who used to live in Rochester um, bought land and built a house on it o over here in Zumbro Falls up on the bluffs over the river. And um, since they've had to move, well, my stepdad passed away, but my mom has moved back into Rochester. And so my husband and I are buying that land and would love to be able to retire there. I'm not quite up for the commute to the cities, but I sure hope I can retire early enough to enjoy its beautiful spot. So what I'm going to try and talk about is a little bit of defining soil quality and what the soil habitat is for soil organisms, especially because a lot of people are very interested in that as an aspect of soil quality. And then talk about what some of the um, 
management systems that can try and maintain or improve soil quality, um, which is then also going to affect water quality. And let's see if I, oh, there we go. Um, so I'm especially going to be talking some about trying to reduce tillage and using cover cropping and showing some examples of some um, cover crop, rye cover crop that's going on he, right here in uh, southeast Minnesota. Um, and so to start with, what is soil quality? And I imagine most of you are familiar. This kind of became a real buzz term in the 90s, soil quality or soil health. I think um, the idea was this was something that would be a real accessible concept to people because it's kind of similar to the idea of water quality or air quality, that um, if we can preserve our soil quality, that's going to be, you know, we've known for a long time that they're going to be, there are better and worse soils for production, but that this might be a way for even the lay public that's not involved with agriculture to kind of have a better concept of um, soils. So soil quality is one indicator of environmental health and it really depends on how the soil functions for the use that you have in mind. So it's important that it be able to produce crops. Um, it's also very important that it's regulating and partitioning water flow in the environment so you want plenty of water to percolate through the soil where it can get filtered as um, the soil acts as a kind of a buffer for filtering out bad stuff, but also storing lots of it underground so not too much of it goes overground and we end up with flooding. So there's multiple um, uses for soil. These are some of the things that are important, obviously, for plants to grow in soils. Um, they have to have good tilth and be fertile and you need a good soil surface that is going to um, not crust up and keep you from um, keep seedlings from growing. You've got to have good root growth, good nutrient balances, and support organisms that both cycle the organic matter, so release the organic nutrients, um, and also help the plants be uh, resistant to pathogens and diseases and so forth. And as an environmental buffer, you want that soil to um, hold on to the nutrients. For example, nitrate, let's say, we know that that can leach through the groundwater. You want a soil that can manage to have um, nutrients held when you want them held, but released to the plant when the plant needs them. And you also want soils to be able to act as that kind of like a um, chromatography columns, sucking out bad chemicals, pesticides, and so forth before they reach our water supply. And again, the idea of regulating and partitioning the water so that you have as much as you can getting into the groundwater and reducing the amount that's um, running off and that you're storing, you're maintaining enough in storage that you can supply a crop uh, through the growing season. So soil quality depends partly on things that we can't have any control over and then partly on management that we can control. So here in Minnesota, for example, we're blessed with um, pretty cool, it's relatively cooler than lots of parts of the country, for example, or the world. Um, and also we have more rainfall, especially in this part of the state compared to, say, the western edge of the state. And both of those things mean that you can grow a lot of biomass um, and you're going to have a slower amount of decomposition or decomposition is going to happen more slowly. So, for example, in California, where I studied for years, that's where I got my uh, PhD, there's almost no organic matter in the soil. In fact, I get really kind of heat off at my colleagues out there because they'll be able to say that cover crops there can increase the organ soil organic matter by 50 percent. And that's because they're starting with 
like a half a percent organic matter. So, so uh, it's a lot harder for us to actually see some of the positive changes from management because our soils are so well buffered with organic matter, which is a blessing. Except for, for example, um, real sandy soils, and there again is one of those things that we don't, we can't control. If the soil texture has more clay, then you tend to be able to build more organic matter than where you have lots of um, sand. But then there are things we can control, and probably if you're going to say what the number one uh, soil quality indicator I'd vote for is organic matter. It, every, if you can be building organic matter, that's the key to everything. And if we can increase additions to, of organic matter and reduce losses, decrease the losses of organic matter, that's um, our goal. And these are a number of the practices that can have an effect on <coughs> organic matter building or decreasing. So the idea, I think, with this concept of soil quality, and there was a lot of a flurry of research around that, kind of looking at, well, what would be the indicators that you'd want to use to try and see whether or, or, um, soil quality is being maintained or building versus whether we're losing soil quality. And uh, just measuring organic matter content, for example, because our soils are well buffered, doesn't really tell you a lot. So we kind of looked for more active fractions of organic matter that you could measure. So you might do incubations to see how much carbon is decomposed when everything's in ideal conditions over a short period of time. Or you might look at the microbial biomass, get a measure of the amount, the, the percent of the carbon in the soil, or the percent of the soil that is microbial carbon, which we do by doing a fumigation procedure. So. Um, and then, of course, things like pH and nutrients are going to be important to crops, so if that's your purpose. So there are a number of indicators that people wanted to measure, and the idea was maybe this is something we need to kind of keep tabs on to see if we're moving in the right direction or, at, or if our practices are improving our soil quality. These are some of the things that producers use as descriptions of soil health and um, of course farmers know what good soils, they smell good, they're easy to work, you know you use less energy trying to drive your implements on them. Uh, you can uh, see how quickly they decompose organic matter, how long do your residues take to decompose. You can see if you've got more earthworms or more um, healthier roots, pull up roots and see if they're that turgid white or if they look brown or spotty or diseased. So there's a lot of things um, farmers have observed. They're obviously the most intimate with, um, I always like the expression, the best fertilizer is the farmer's footprint. The, the farmer is the one who knows the soils better than, than the rest of us do. If we look at soil as a habitat for organisms, and probably a lot of you are familiar with this, we know that the soil is about half and half solids versus <coughs> void spaces. And usually we think of the ideal for those poor spaces, those empty spaces in the soil, is that it, you know, when it's at the right water content for growing plants, it'd be about half full of water and half full of air, because roots need both water and oxygen to um, grow and take up nutrients. And that uh, solid fraction is made up of sand, silt, and clay, which determines the texture, the relative proportions of each of those. And then organic matter, <coughs> which as I said in California might be a half a percent, but out here is often more like two or three or more percent um, in our soil. So soil water is an important um, factor in how that soil acts as a habitat for organisms. Uh, we need to have some water there. For example, bacteria live in water films on the surface of PEDs, the surface of um, aggregates. So there has to be some water 
um, for the organisms in the soil, but there also does have to be plenty of oxygen available because on most, well, when the soil is well aerated, you have aerobic um, processes going on, aerobic decomposition happening, and there needs to be oxygen available for that. And that um, amount of water will also determine uh, some of the other chemical indicators for soils. As I said, bacteria and their um, grazers feed the organisms that feed on them, like protozoa and so forth, live in water films. Fungi will grow across air-filled pore, pores. Um, and earthworms are in the very large pores, and as you know, those have to be air-filled or those earthworms end up on top of the soil instead of in the soil. And the roots need both large pores and small pores. Um, the large pores allow the roots to grow down and exploit the soil volume, but they need those smaller ones because those hold water more tightly, and so they can access water during times when um, the soil water con is low, it's drying out. And so you get an incredible amount of heterogeneity in the soil. This is just looking at an aggregate that's not even a centimeter across. That, so it's things like as big as your thumbnail, and this shows oxygen concentrations inside that um, aggregate because towards the center um, it's holding, it's got lots of tiny, tiny pores that are going to hold water really tightly, but as it gets, because the oxygen can diffuse in to the aggregate near the outside surface of that aggregate, you're going to have higher oxygen concentrations. So you can have aerobic or oxygen feeding microbes living within millimeters of anaerobic processes going on in the soil where that require um, there to be no oxygen present. So if you can imagine, you know, we have this terrible job of trying to sample for things like different soil quality indicators or for soil fertility across a field where we take 15 samples and aggregate them and take an average and we have this much heterogeneity inside every, um, inside very small spaces. So the soil is Fascinating, but incredibly complex milieu. And this just shows how you can get quite a variation in um, oxygen and carbon dioxide content over time. This shows different depths in the soil um, through a growing season. So the uh, oxygen is up at the top and the CO2 down at the bottom. And you can see during um, the, the spring, you can end up, as the plants take off growing and your soil is still pretty wet, you can end up with very depleted oxygen concentrations at depth and very high CO2 concentrations. So you can see we have seasonal variation, so t changes in time as well as a lot of spa spatial variation. And again, this uh, incredibly complex um, soil environment at many scales, you're going to have differences in organisms and processes going on at the root surface or in aggregates or around pieces of litter or animal feces, for example. Differences in um, larger or smaller pores. So it's a very complex environment. This is just showing along a root surface um, the differences you can see from a root tip going back through the root hair zone. I don't know how many of you have ever seen those little fuzzy root hairs um, not far back from the base of a young root zone where the lateral roots are coming out and dead roots you're getting sloughing off of the outer um, cell layers. And this shows some of the things that are going to change along just that, you know, here again, this is along a couple of centimeters long, a few centimeters length of roots. You're going to have differences in plant nutrient uptake. That's mostly 
happens at the root hair zone and then where you have um, lateral roots branching off. Um, mineralizable nutrients because that happens behind where you have microbial biomass. So the biomass are feeding on this sloughed off material and exudates here at the root tip. So here are the, here's the microbial biomass. Here are the grazers, the, predat the predators on that micro on the bacteria and fungi that are growing there. And then as they are um, secreting their waste products, you have mineralized nitrogen and so forth. So just along these few centimeters, you have big differences in, um, and then this is soil organic carbon because you've got the turnover of the microorganisms in that sphere. Plus you have the root leaking out at these points and where you have lateral roots breaking through. So again, very diverse environment. So soil structure is one of, I think if, if I, organic matter is maybe the number one indicator, active um, organic matter pools for soil quality, but soil structure is a really good indicator because it's an integrator of a lot of other things that are going on in the soil. And by soil structure I mean those um, clumps of soil, the gra granules of soil when you pick up a um, handful of soil, the way the soil holds together in small centimeter or a few millimeter um, aggregates. So how, how the soil is structured is going to have a big effect on the organisms, but it also works in reverse that the roots and the organisms are what helps to build soil structure. So the roots, especially from grasses or our small grains, um, very fibrous, fine-rooted species are really good at making these kind of mesh bags around soil particles and creating aggregate structure, um, as well as fungal hyphae, uh, especially mycorrhizae, for example, that extend their hyphae out <coughs> from the root and bundle aggregates of soil together. And then the bacteria, which um, have kind of uh, gels, microbial gels or mucilage that helps also hold um, particles together. So, oh that's really hard to see. <laughs> this is showing if you slake, if you set soil from a woodlot, an undisturbed soil um, on a petri dish or in a jar, top of a jar, um, versus from a field where there's been uh, continuous corn and frequent tillage and cultivation and you just it, not by slaking those aggregates but just letting them wet gently from the bottom you can see the difference in how much better held together these um, undisturbed soils are where that um, enmeshment by organisms and plants really holds that soil structure together. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. You start down here on the clay size scale. You've got clay platelets that <coughs> get bundled together by um, bacterial gels and so forth. And then they form these tiny micro aggregates which then get bundled together by hyphae and roots into um, larger aggregates or macro aggregates which include pore spaces um, between those micro aggregates. And those, it's just another picture of that, offer a lot of different um, habitats for organisms in the soil. And of course aggregates get busted apart by um, our field operations, but also by rain impact. Um, and once we lose, um, you know, this kind of shows a downward spiral of soil structural degradation 
if you get some erosion, so you lose some organic matter, and then that ends up um, meaning you have less holding that soil together, so the aggregates break down, and then you, again, make the soil more uh, susceptible to loss because those particles may crust um, at the surface. You might get compaction. And as this continues, you're going to end up losing soil quality and having um, lower crop yields. And just to kind of recap, the organic matter is just a few percent of the soil solids. Um, some 10 to 30 percent of that organic matter is this active fraction that may be stable in the soil for a season or a year or two, and the rest is that very stable humus. But if we can measure this active fraction, we can get an idea of how um, our management is affecting our soil and the direction the active fraction is going is going to tell us the direction our soil and organic matter in general is going. And that active fraction includes both uh, decomposable, easily decomposed soil organic matter and litter and roots, but also is about a third the actual organisms in the soil, which are um, the fungi are dominant, then also bacteria and uh, their, um, the grazers on the bacteria and fungi, and then the larger soil fauna. And this just shows this food web. Um, I'm not going to go into that. Just a wow about uh, soil microorganisms. I don't know how many of you have heard or thought about the fact that in one teaspoon of soil there are more bacteria than there are people on the planet Earth. So that's uh, pretty impressive. And the diversity of those organisms is incredible. Um, millions of species and large amount of biomass in the soil. It's about 2% of the um, I think of the soil carbon is microbes, uh, microorganisms. And, you know, as much as we do know, we are only able right now to culture about seven or eight percent of the organisms that are in the soil, the microorganisms. So we don't, we can't even know very much about the other 90 plus percent because we can't grow them, know that we have them, and be able to study them. So it's pretty amazing. These are some of the things that I've been talking about and um, that are going to influence the numbers of those organisms. Um, the depth because of oxygen levels and amount of organic matter that's available. Tillage, as I mentioned, um, can have a big effect. What organic matter additions go on there in terms of residue and manure and uh, cropping system. This just shows that where you have the most roots, obviously, is where you're going to have the most, and, and the most residue is where you're going to have the most microbes. Um, pH can have a big effect as well. And temperatures. Um, this is in our part of the country. You're going to have a lot more, th the peak of your microbial activity here in the early summer when the soil is really uh, still real moist. Um, the temperatures have warmed up, so there's been lots of um, physical breakdown of the organic matter and that's all sitting there waiting wonderful food for those organisms to eat. So real peak of activity as it warms up and then things kind of die down as the plant reaches its, um, stops putting on a lot of vegetative growth and is focused on filling in grain. So 
just talk about a few couple of examples of um, some things going on uh, that I think are management practices that if we can encourage them they can be really beneficial for soil quality and then I'm hoping there'll be lots of times time for you guys to ask me your questions. So this just shows how um, much organic matter we can lose uh, where we have erosion happening. You can lose up to half of the organic matter when erosion happens. And if you think about the fact that when we broke the sod in the first place, we lost about half of the organic matter right then. And then if we allow erosion to be happening, we can lose another half of it. That's a lot of organic matter we're losing. And a lot of carbon we aren't keeping sequestered either. So these show how residue management affects um, soil organic matter. So this is in some different climate situations um, showing how organic matter you have to add at least a certain amount of residue each year just to maintain organic matter at the same level. This is one of the big concerns I think about the idea of doing cellulosic ethanol if we really tried to grow corn for example which we know is a crop that as a row crop and it's it can be pretty hard on soil and if you're in erosive potentially erosive situations especially and then if we're thinking we're going to take all the residue we can because we're going to try and use that for um, cellulosic ethanol it's a real concern that we could potentially um, really deteriorate our soils pretty quickly so that I don't know that we could even, we'd have to add that many more nutrients and so forth to be able to um, maintain the production. Plus we'd be flushing a lot of nutrients down that Mississippi River. Um, so for different uh, situations you can see um, requiring different amounts of residue added to maintain that soil organic matter. I think Sweden is the least because it's um, so much colder that you don't have the, that burning up of the organic matter. This shows uh, rotation effects where you have uh, corn and soybean rotation. You are basically going to, um, it's hard to keep your organic matter levels constant in a corn and soybean rotation. Whereas with the small grain, like, to, like I said, those fine fibrous roots of the small grain can really help build organic matter. And especially where you have uh, grass or forage, uh, some kind of pasture in that rotation, so that you go for a period of time without tilling, so you're not doing annual tillage, that's going to really bump up your um, soil organic matter and soil quality. These are some results from a study I did um, out in Lamberton, Minnesota on the long-term cropping systems trial out at the uh, Southwest Research and Outreach Center, the old uh, experiment station there. They had a two-year and four-year rotation. The two-year is um, corn and soybeans and the four-year is a corn, soybean, oat, interceded to alfalfa, alfalfa rotation. And um, so these were in two years when we tried to go out and measure a bunch of soil quality indicators at this site. And these treatments are a low purchased input. This is really a, a soil saver, a little bit of reduced tillage, realistic yield goal, and banded applications. I'm not supposed to stand in the light. Um, the HPI is uh, high purchased inputs, which is with a 10% over realistic yield go, you know, the farmers want to make sure they don't put on too few nutrients, right? So higher nutrients, but the nutrients are broadcast and a more intensive tillage situation. And the organic, which is also um, more intensive tillage, but with, with manure as a source of nutrients instead of fertilizer. And then the min treatment was just to see and talk about our rich buffered soils. This has been in there since 1989. So at this point it was um, 11 years. It's 
I think they're just making some changes to that, that um, those cropping systems out there now. So in 15 years that that was running, the minimum treatment, which was only treated by doing delayed um, planting to try and deal with the weeds, but with no nutrients added. Now, of course, the yields were crummy, but the soil quality still was there. I mean, that soil could still produce because it just got such a, so much rich. It's a clay loam soil. But this shows how, this is percent stable aggregates greater than a millimeter, which is one way we measure aggregate stability. You can also do a, a mean, geometric mean diameter. Um, but this shows that actually our high purchase input system where we had that more intensive tillage um, and then the uh, broadcast nutrients, uh, broadcast fertilizer treatments had lower aggregates uh, aggregation than the low purchased input and the organic treatment with the organic kind of intermediate in the two year and equal to the low purchased input in the four year. And uh, so basically what, and, and if we look again, well then the other thing to say is you can see that aggregation changes year to year, just depending on what the moisture situation was, how well things were growing. Um, you can also see that generally the four year was better than the two year, which kind of makes sense because you've got that um, oat alfalfa in there, which is also going to build aggregation. The thing that was kind of sad was that they also have every crop in every year in that study. And when we go in and look in the four-year rotation versus the two-year rotation at the same thing, that percent of aggregates greater than a millimeter, um, you can definitely see the benefit of the oat, alfalfa, and alfalfa on aggregation. But once we till that alfalfa up, our corn kind of goes right back down to the same um, level of aggregation as we have in that two-year rotation. So basically what we want to do is try and um, be as judicious with our tillage as we can. So these are some of the advantages with doing that fall strip till. You do get warmer, drier soil in the strip and you do get good returns, at least in this study they found that. Um, you can leave up to half or more of the residue uh, untouched. You can use, have fewer field passes and use uh, less fuel, which is a good thing. Now our gas tax went up. Um, labor and machinery. One of the problems is it can be hard to manage always getting where you want to be. Um, it does take more tractor power than a drill or no-till planter and it seems to be that the advantage really is where it's wetter and colder. It's not really a benefit in the, in the cases where that's not um, the case. And then it does need some skillful tillage so that you can get the corn planted into the strips. <coughs> so that's one way. I mean, you can imagine that basically you're getting over two-thirds of the field where you're not doing any tillage. You're getting those soil quality benefits that we've been looking at, and you only um, are disrupting that soil and be beating up those aggregates and turning over that organic matter in those um, in those strips. Cover crops are another um, way that you can try and build. We've talked about having that cover on the soil is good because it's reducing the erosion and that spiraling down effect of um, potential for losses. Um, you also have more roots in the soil for more of the time and that's going to be a benefit. And I know cover crops can be a hassle to uh, manage. Um, but you can get some distinct benefits, especially in certain systems. 
So these are some of the benefits that uh, cover crops can give. This is sh showing in Michigan, I think, a pumpkin planted in a winter rye cover crop. I think this is a no-till system. And this is showing some cover crops, how they can control weeds. Um, this is following snap beans, again, in Michigan. And the pounds per acre of biomass of the cover crop versus the weed. And so you can see quite a bit of um, weed control, especially by um, this oilseed radish, hairy vetch oats. And this rotation comparison, um, just talking about can you have roots in the soil for as long as possible. These are some different systems out further west um, where you're getting a diversity of species and in some cases up to 90%. This is a winter wheat uh, with a cover crop. Getting 90% of the active growing season part of the year with roots in the soil. So that's a lot of carbon inputs for um, building organic matter. Now one of the problems with um, cover crops is what you do with them and whether you can be timely in to deal with them um, when you're putting in your cash crop. And so uh, I know a lot of organic growers now are trying to work with cover crops a lot more but are um, trying out some different rollers and crimpers and ways to try and um, mechanically kill <coughs> those cover crops. If you're not organic, it's a lot easier to um, be able to burn them down and then leave that um, burned down crop on the surface as a mulch. So these are some of the tops, and I think you've got a book back here about uh, cover crops in <coughs> around the country that's got a lot of information for each of the different regions and a lot of tips for using those. There's a new cover crop uh, group in the north central region. In fact, we have a meeting in a couple weeks over in Purdue that's trying to collect all the information from around different parts of the north central region. Um, you know, the southeast has been able to use cover crops for a long time because it's a whole lot easier for them to have that other crop fit into the um, growing season. But there are a number of people using them now in our region as well. These are some of the nitrogen fertilizer replacement values for those crops and some typical rooting depths. So that's some pretty big, great depths of being able to um, put that organic matter down with the roots. And this chart just shows um, you can manage your cover crop differently depending on whether you're really using the cover crop, if it's a legume, to try and get enhanced nitrogen availability or whether you're interested in building soil organic matter. So are you managing it for nitrogen or are you managing it for carbon? So if it's for nitrogen, you're going to want to have lots of legumes in your mix and you want to check the growth real early when that cover crop's real green because then it's full of nitrogen and you're going to get that um, green manure effect. But if you are trying to manage it to just build organic matter, then you're going to be using um, summer cover crops, grasses, and high seeding rates, and then try to let the crop grow as long as possible so that it's not going to have a low C to N ratio, it's going to have a very high C to N ratio, which means it's not going to burn up fast when it gets um, put down in the soil. So my last few slides are just pictures from um, Andy Hart. How many of you guys know Andy? So you've all seen this stuff. I don't need to show these. <laughs> um, we're, we're starting a collaboration with him. Um, that's been funded by the Board of Soil and Water Resources to try and take some more measurements on his um, rye versus no rye sites along with some other farmers um, that are, are trying this uh, helicopter seeding of rye 
cover crops. So the neat thing here is that by having these in a grazed, grazing system, you can actually use the rye both in the fall and in the spring for animals to graze on and have um, those permanent pastures rest. He's not a grazer, but he rents land from a grazer. And so you do get that value added of the forage that is um, there you're able to use. So this just shows a progression of what that rye looks like through time. Um, so this is already September 9th and you've already got that uh, rye that was flown over emerging in here it is in the soybeans. And I went backwards, sorry. I'm sorry. Here it is, September 18th, and here it is, October 12th. Even in that understory, you've got a fair amount of that rye growing. Lots where it's opened up, obviously. Here in the soybean stubble in November, early November, it's ready to graze and even in the field corn, again, a pretty reasonable crop. And it, f it really fills out fast, even if there's quite a delay. <clears throat> so um, we're trying to look at, uh, you know, what's the timing for putting that rye on? What's the window? Because if you wait too late, and that's one of the problems, is Scott's helicopter service is busy with um, spraying from mosquitoes at the state fair right around exactly the time when we want to, or and for mosquitoes elsewhere too, but right around the time when we, is the best time to try and get that um, rye seeded. But um, I think there's enough interest that if we find good results, there's the potential for somebody else to help Scott. <laughs> they didn't get a seed installed. No, they didn't. It was a great frustration. They ended up having to drill it in. But this year, we're, we bought Scott's time. This, for this coming year, we've bought Scott's time. He has sworn a solemn oath, because we're, we're paying we're this money from Bowser, because we have to be able to test it. I mean, it ain't going to work if we can't make it happen. But um, that's, the, that's the reason it didn't get planted? Oh, well, there were the, the times. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was either bad weather and the mosquitoes, and then, well, he had a, he had a, one helicopter broke down or crashed or something, and one fuel truck, the, the one, the day we were finally going to do it, then the fuel truck broke down. So they couldn't bring the fuel to refuel it. So it was terribly frustrating. But for three years, they, and it worked out. So you're shooting for August 15th? Yes. That is the goal, is to shoot for August 15th. And if the weather's kind of dry, is it still going to work? Well, what they've it's found is that it just sits there. It sits there. And even if, yeah, even if it gets wet and starts to grow and then dries up, it'll still sit there and come back. It's, it's, a rye is amazing. And I had it in my garden at Zumbra Falls. I'm using it as a cover crop in my big garden. And it's incredible. It just sits there green under the snow all year. As soon as that snow melts off, it's just bright green. It's, it never browns up. Just, I mean, the edges, but the crown is just as green as can be all winter long. It's amazing. Yes? Does it cause harvest problems in soybeans if it grows too well? Well, growing it growing too well is definitely a, a worry, but I... I asked Andy the exact question. He said that even if it does get a little taller and you run some of fine and more stuff, it, it's not it a problem. It falls through. <coughs> the big problem has been to, uh, for some people working with it, is you, you just can't let it get away in the spring. If, if you, right. you let it get too tall in the spring, then you've got a real headache to deal with. So. Uh, is he using chemical controller or is he actually using a roller to print it down? I think he's using chemical control, yeah. But I definitely I know of people in other parts of the country and there are more organic growers trying to do it and using the crimper 
uh, pretty successfully. But their timing on that becomes a real issue too. Yep. Uh, some of them have gone to the point where they're only twice. So not yeah, and then. And then but the trouble with that is to be able to get the planning equipment able to crack that open it up to get the seed in the ground. Yeah. So have how many of you have you done some or you were going to? Oh, we were going to. Uh huh. Just, were, well, you got to so sign. You got to sign on with us this year. Yeah, I'm probably on the because we were going to do it. Just never. Yeah. That's really frustrating. Is this a time for me to do it, or can you actually do it with us, or could you do it with, a, with an airplane? Well, um, Round Horse, is that his name? Round Horse. He did it with the airplane, but I think, yeah, I think Scott and Andy swear by the helicopter because it's real slick how you can just come down and they can fill those buckets up in minutes. And I think it's a bigger procedure, you know, so, so they can do a lot of acreage really pretty fast. Right. Right. Because they don't get that many acres on a on a fill, on a fill right. so they're just they're constantly filled. Fill. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's, what a what a high clearance spreader from the co-op with the narrow tires. If it didn't run down anything, would they be able to? Oh, high boys is how some people have done it. You know, we're we're kind of trying. Well, well, and you can just beans. right. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can, of course, you can drill it in. I mean, he started out with using it on his canning crops because they're they're done early. Just is really, and can we get it to work with corn, field corn? Partly because we're there now. We're seeing so many more acres of field corn, right. and um, that's a potential for a lot of erosion. Plus, all that nitrogen you got to put on corn, so this rye can kind of suck it up and keep it from washing away. Um, but it's harder to manage in corn, and there have been people in Iowa, too, working on whether there's a yield hit or not. And Andy swears that he thinks that it, his ground is just getting kind of used to having that cover crop on it and cycling, you know, doing that mineralization and cycling it through. So he's convinced that, you know, because he's seen that he did have a little yield hit early on, but that he has had less and less of a problem, and he, he doesn't. Have good success in corn either, though. No, because you can't get it down to the ground. Right, it's hard. Well, I don't know. He said you have to put on so much to get it down to the ground. I mean, that's the problem. Yes, that's that's what I was getting yeah. at with the with a, with a pool on a high boy sprayer that you could actually. Well, you'd have to have drop. You'd have to have some sort of a drop to get drop. it in there. Yeah. Drop. Yeah, using, like a Gandhi, using a Gandhi type of, I, well, I mean, they're yeah, well, it's available because the guy's using wheat. Yeah. What, well, they're putting right? on 70, I think, was, was that right? 70 pounds? You started with 50 and like you said, yeah. yeah. You guys know more about it than me. What, what, what is the seed? Usually the case. What is the seed supply and the cost, especially now with well, the cost and everything else going up? I mean, the yeah. cost effective. Well, and what we're looking for is, and, and it looks like it's actually, at least up in the Red River Valley, they're actually putting equip dollars into it. It's like, well, if they're going to pay incentives for some other operations, why couldn't they pay the cost of the rye seed or pay the cost of the helicopter so that it makes it a reasonable, off, you know, to offset that cost, give some incentive to somebody to put that on because of the benefits. And that's what we're going to try and document. So can we weigh that we reduce the yield hit and we're going to use rainfall simulators and take a lot of measurements to try and show what are the benefits to these active pools of organic matter? What are the benefits with reducing um, erosion and nutrient losses in runoff and so forth and are there or aren't there and if we can document that maybe we can build the case for more things like equip dollars or other offsets to the cost of producers to use that. Have you, have you seen any difference from the western part of the state to the eastern part of the state as far as 
Oh, yeah, the western part of the state. Yeah, and, and I. And they benefited because they have a cover crop that doesn't dry out as much. They're able to possibly retain more moisture. Well. Or is the flip side is. No, there's a concern. That's another thing we want to measure. A concern is, are we going to deplete? Especially because we're. It's looking like it's going to get drier. Um, as we. So that's a concern about it. If we deplete water moisture supplies where you're not irrigating. I mean, they've been using it in potatoes for a long time. It's great in potatoes, but they're, they, you know, they're just pouring water on it. Yeah, so the then it doesn't have. Yeah, silage corn and then coming in and uh, we, we drilled, yeah, we, we did some of that uh, last year for a neighbor. Uh, we just went in with a conventional till drill and put right. winter wheat in. Yep. He had a heck of a crop. Yes, you can drill it into yeah. silage corn right. too. Now I'll tell you another, another worry about doom. My colleague John Baker, working with USDA, they did some work with a big dairy guy out near Morris, Minnesota, doing the um, silage, uh, and they were able to get a lot of biomass crop from the rye for feeding this these dairy animals. They were delighted with this, but last year was a dry year, and they had a big hit on their corn yields. And when they went in for their crop insurance, they said no, because they had had a second crop on that ground. That's nasty. That's really but nasty. If they wouldn't have taken that as a, as a feed, it would have been all right for right? Right. But, you know, he was trying to get, to get that feed out of it. He's not sure to him to do if he can't, have, you know, so these are the, the problems have to get worked out. There again, that seems to me like a wrong, you know, why should he be penalized for having tried to do a good practice that made sense? Yeah, it's a policy problem. Any other questions? Just an, an observation, I know there's some farmers down in Fillmore County that um, leave a portion of their rye and harvest that seed so they, to eliminate that problem. It doesn't have to be particularly clean to have in the helicopter. I don't think, you know, I mean, it can't be too dirty because that I mean, far, it costs have, something have to have the weight, but you that. can have. Yeah. And the, getting the rye seed, that's a good idea to have the rye that you want because that's another problem we run into. Now we're trying to get, you know, the prices, I think last year were $8 and then when we were checking on trying to reserve some because this coming season we want to plant some the beginning of August, the middle of August, and the end of August, just to kind of bracket the window, you know, what would be potential times. And the prices are up $13 now. So, you know, that's another issue. You want to have your a good, reliable source of rice. <laughs> and if you do raise your hand, it makes a ton of straw. Yeah. Is there, is there, now is that, that's an annual rye, correct? It's not a, Oh no, this is all cereal rye. This is grain rye. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah, but yes, it's annual rye. I mean, no, it's not perennial rye grass. Uh uh uh. No, it's the annual rye. But not annual rye grass, the grass. Not grain. rye grass. The cereal rye, rye cereal. grain. So in the spring it's dead. No, 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 because it overwinters. It's like winter wheat. One kill, one year. It is. It is, yeah, it's is incre It's yeah. definitely the most cold tolerant of any. Organic yeah. people really struggle timing yeah. getting the rollers to grow because if it's wet, it keeps right on chugging and yeah. it gets to be a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. To, to try to get it to break, and that's why they're actually rolling it one way and it comes back the other way to try to get that thing to. Well, and I know that. Once well, you get a bat like that, then it won't come back. But if you want to get it kind of tilted, then it'll come right back. And it needs to be. Tilt, not by tilling it, just by just crimping it over. Yeah, they do doing a big roller crimper. 48 inch diameter roller. Like giant uh, cold packers. Yep. Okay. And just, just, just like you were rolling linoleum. Yeah. You got to have some weight to it. Okay. But they have to, you know, if the plan is like that, they want to make sure they take that joint and get that joint busted. And then it'll just die because it can't because it's dead okay but if they just lay it over then it comes right back up again and that's so you why might have to roll it twice then you're saying that's 
the, if it gets too far along, you can't well, get good enough tougher and tougher kill. Sure they have to kind of beat it down twice. Because yeah. really the garden is very tough to kill just by tilling it. Right. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's the other thing that's with the and for weed control is is you know do they mow more plow it? Yeah. Disc and tip, you know. Yeah, and, and that's, get it back into shape, and then all just like you say, it kind of destroys. Yeah. So a structure. So I know Paul Porter's been looking at using the rye in organic um, soybeans. And then I think they're also looking at whether there's some other rye varieties that might be easier to deal with or um, even trying some triticale and other crops that might not. Because the rye is big at the no-till conference. They talk about Oregon rye. And you can just, you know, whether the supply is going to continue to meet this demand. Or, you know, that's, that's the yeah. question. But that idea of basically growing your own and having that seed supply mm -hmm. there every year would be, you know, if the timing of that harvest would be, get it harvested by the time you get it clean, you're ready to put it back down. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Early. yeah, it's earlier really, really than normal. So. But there again, you know, are you going to feed that for yield? Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, those. I mean, there's, there's, right. there's a lot of questions. A lot of trade up. That needs to, you know, to dial it in for Wisconsin, Minnesota versus a yep. wetter area versus a drier area right. versus yeah. Iowa and so on. So, good research, though. Yeah, I think <laughs> it'll be keep 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 the cereal people busy. <laughs> Have you done much work with the clover or the cured clover? I know. Craig Schaefer has yeah. done a lot with yeah. that, and I'm not that. Um, well, and I think John Baker was going to be trying some of that out, too. I know that sometimes they've had a real hard time getting good establishment, but I don't know if he's worked out the kinks in that. It seems like if you can get it established, that can be really good, but sometimes it's tricky to get it established. Any other questions? I'm so glad you guys knew all these answers. Yes. <laughs> You started your presentation, you talked about maintaining a certain level of organic matter in our soils. And I guess I've got a question of if crop residue is removed, you know, some of those have or whatever, it, what's the breaking point if you wanted to maintain what you have? Well, that's, I think there's a lot of people trying to do some research on that right now because that looks like it's coming down the pike. and just kind of based on some modeling exercises and old data that's being resurrected, not specifically addressing this because we didn't know about this then. I know Jane Johnson out at Morris, she thinks you'd have to leave, and a number of others, that you'd have to leave at least 30% of the residue behind to not start a negative impact um, organic matter and your soil quality. And that's not considering erosion, that's just considered as organic that's just, matter. That's right. That's right. That's just uh, just the removal of that organic matter source because that's what's keeping organic matter. You can do a back of the envelope calculation. I have my students in my class do that. You know how much because you only leave behind so much of the carbon. Most of it burns off, right? As CO2 in the atmosphere. You can figure out how much residue you've got to have to raise your organic matter by a half a percent or whatever. It's a phenomenal amount. So to keep it just to keep it even it takes a lot of organic matter. So there, it, it, it's really worrisome to think about, for any of the crops we're talking about, really, I mean, especially something like corn, but even if you're gonna do switchgrass or this uh, giant, what's it called? The Miscanthus or something. Miscanthus, right, you know. Well, maybe that one's different, because I think that spreads. That's the grass. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a worry for other reasons. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you're going to take it down to the nub, we're going to have huge erosion problems and soil degradation and not be able to conti continue to support crop on that ground. And then you're just using the soil as an inner growing medium. It's like sand. And that's going to take a huge amounts of energy and nutrients to, and water to keep that going. It's a big worry to me. I guess 
I have to say, I think morale is kind of low in the soils <laughs> department these days because between Tillman out there saying that, oh, we're just going to plant prairie everywhere as if that's an easy job. And that's what we got to do. And then the idea that, no, no, we're, we're going to use do cellulosic ethanol and grow corn from fence post to fence post again. And I don't know. It's, it's kind of scary. Does the Chicago Board of Trade uh, get involved in carbon credits then with agriculture the way it is? How, how, how is that coming into play? I know a lot of us here have probably gotten letters about, you know, sign on the dotted line and we'll buy your carbon credits and then we're going to sell them. Yeah. I get. I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but my worry is that I've seen, for example, I've seen the articles that summarize the stuff where you go on the web and it'll talk about all these benefits from no-till. Well, it turns out in a number of soils, if you manage your tillage well, you can hold just as much carbon because all these results from no-till, and I'm not saying don't no-till. I mean, no-till's great in certain situations and where it's not too cold and wet. But really, a lot of your big bump up in carbon is at the surface because you're not tilling it in. But if you measure over the depth of tillage or even below, because you often get more biomass in the tilled system, you end up with, at least in some soils, as much carbon under a tilled system as under a no-till system. And here they are calculating carbon credits. And, and you know, in some places that's just not true. I know in no-till can be a huge advantage because tilling that stuff up, you really burn it off faster. But for us, we're putting some down below and that can hold on to some of it. So if you measure the whole profile. And yet they're saying, well, since you're gonna have 30% more carbon, we know we're gonna trade these as carbon credits. And I'm just thinking, is this, is this all for real, or is this all a hand-waving exercise? So I guess my worry, it's kind of like when I paid $5 to get carbon, you know, an extra $5 that was going to go to a good carbon cause for my airplane ticket. You know, it's like, I'll do it because it's maybe going for a good cause, but I don't know how much science it's based on or whether it's going to make any real difference. So I haven't really seen the benefit. Do you know people who are actually working with the carbon markets yet? I'm not, but I don't know. I've, I've I think letters. there's a lot of waiting and seeing. The place in Chicago, I think. The Farmers Union is trying to do some things. I can't remember who else they're partnering with. But I think there is research trying to figure out how do you actually do this little calculation. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think some of it is pushing toward kind of these beneficial beneficial uses or other right. ways we to know. benefit farmers for the benefits of their land. Right. So I think in terms of a policy push, it's good, but the science is, is lagging. It's a very complicated well, and it's I don't even think they know all the variables. Right. You know? And it isn't easy so, to yeah. measure these active carbon measures that, that would be the way to really tell. And you can't just plunk down and take a, get a total carbon measurement and have that tell you anything. So. And, and then there's the problem, for example, here, even if we do do no-till, with our soils the way they are, you end up getting, it, you build up the bulk density, you stratify the nutrients, and eventually you, we kind of have to do rotational tillage. I mean, after a few years of no-till, we have to do some tillage. Well, you lose, you know, if you, if you were building up, it's just like my changing that, once I till back into the corn, I lose some of that stuff. So. It seems to me we ought to do it based on what we know are good practices. And what we can show is reducing erosion and reducing nutrient losses. And then let's pay the carbon credits to do what we know are good practices instead of making up what, you know, anyway. Well, thanks. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Well, we'd like to thank you for coming and giving a great presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.